Good morning. It's actually, it's a real honor to be here, Evan. Thank you for inviting us to be part of this uh, really important discussion about something that affects every single one of us. Um, it's wonderful also to be with some of the leading minds in this area. Uh, and so we know, of course, as Evan said repeatedly, there's no question that food security is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And these leaders hopefully will point the way to um, solutions uh, in the future. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Paul Taylor, right here, is the former executive director of Food Share Toronto and is an independent consultant now. Inbal Becker Reshef is director of the NASA Harvest Program and professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland. Jennifer Grenz leads the Indigenous Ecology Lab at the University of British Columbia. And Patrick Webb is director for USAID's Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Lab and professor in the School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you. So we are going to begin today with seven minute introductions from each of you. And I would really encourage all of you, but certainly all of you to keep a few notes for our discussion afterwards. You will have exactly seven minutes. We're treating this like a, a live radio show. Uh, and then we'll uh, have a little round table of 20 minutes and then we'll come to you with any questions that you might have. So first of all, um, a reminder that this is being recorded for broadcast and we will begin with Paul Taylor. Just if you could self-introduce, if you don't mind, my name is, and then launch with your seven minutes. Certainly. Thank you so much. Certainly. Uh, thank you so much for having me, first and foremost. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Paul Taylor. I worked at Food Share Toronto, now an independent consultant. Um, thanks so much for having me and, and your interest in this important topic. I want to start with acknowledging that, you know, my interest and initial orientation to the issue of food insecurity is a personal one. I was raised by a single mom who was forced to work multiple low-wage jobs at the same time until she couldn't anymore. So for the bulk of my childhood, we relied on welfare. As a child, I remember leaving the school grounds as soon as I was old enough uh, on my own so that I could go on solo walks at lunch. And I did that to hide the fact that I was without food. Like many kids, I was embarrassed. It was painful and an isolating experience. I'll never forget, anyone tells you that food is, is not political, they're, they're wrong, because I will never forget when Mike Harris was elected Premier of Ontario, I was 13, and it was the first election that I really paid attention to. Uh, he talked about this thing, I had no idea what it was at the time, called a common sense revolution. I wasn't sure what it meant, but I would certainly later find out. One of his first actions, some of you will recall this, one of his first actions as Premier was to cut welfare by 22%. 22%. It didn't make sense to me that he, didn't want to he, that he wanted to make life harder for my family. It didn't make sense to me that he wanted us to have less food to eat. It didn't make sense to me that he didn't want us to have heat, hot water, or electricity. That is until it all made sense to me several years later. I've come to realize that food insecurity is often caused by those types of cruel political decisions. I've come to realize that the pain, the stress, and the shame that were bestowed upon my family and many others didn't have to be that way. It was a political choice. Food insecurity has been rising in this country for a long time since then. And the hardest part is that many of us don't see the connection to the choices our political leaders make. I think that our collective lack of understanding of food insecurity is one of the greatest barriers to effectively addressing it. We're taught that the best way to respond to food insecurity in our communities is to collect our leftover and unwanted food and donate it to a food bank. Schools across the country hold food drives so that kids can be taught an important lesson. But I think the lesson that we're really taught is that food insecurity is a community issue, it's an issue of charity, and it can be solved through the kindness of others. We're taught that the solution lies in food bank drives as well as community gardens, are connecting to growing community kitchens, cooking classes, cooking classes for poor people, or even worse, redirecting corporate food waste and directing it into the bellies of low-income people, like there's some sort of walking compost bin. I understand the good intentions, but this does a huge disservice to those made to experience food insecurity. There isn't one single data point that suggests that any of those activities, while they might make us feel good, none of them have proven to have an impact on rates of food insecurity at all. But yet we continue along the same path year after year. And while we continue to do this, the rate of food insecurity in Canada is higher than it's ever been. 
Charity is not a solution to food insecurity, and we need to stop. One of the key things that we need to stop doing is framing uh, food insecurity as hunger. Hunger and food insecurity are not one and the same and shouldn't be used interchangeably. Hunger is something that is experienced at the individual level and may or may not be caused by food insecurity. Someone could be hungry because we forgot lunch on the counter at home or because we just ordered a meal and it hasn't arrived yet. That's not food insecurity. Food insecurity is measured at the household level by Statistics Canada. It actually has less to do with food than it does money. It's about families not having enough money to access the food that they need. Not understanding this key distinction is really important because I think it allows food insecurity to be framed as hunger. And it's what causes many of us to think that food banks is an effective response to this issue or food-based charity. And our politicians reinforce this idea with their photo ops, volunteering, sorting tins at food banks. They have allowed charity to become Canada's default response to a public policy issue. A public policy issue that will never be solved with day-old Starbucks muffins, a school drive, or your family's unwanted tins of cranberry sauce. We desperately need our politicians to put down the tins and start sorting policy. And in particular, policies aimed at protecting families uh, navigating food insecurity. Food insecurity is an absolute crisis in this country. There are six in 2022, 6.9 million people uh, experience food insecurity, yet our politicians refuse to reach for the levers available to them. While food banks across the country are seeing an unprecedented number of visits, many say that they've either run out of food or they're at risk of running out of food. They are just as worried now as the people who show up at their doors for help. Going back to the data, you know, when we look at the data on food insecurity across Canada, there's an interesting anomaly. Quebec has the lowest percentage of people living in food insecure households across the country. Quebec, among other things, is indexing their social entitlements, like welfare and disability income supports, to inflation. They've also been leaders, we all know this, at introducing progressive social and economic policies for a long time. Quebec recognizes the role that public policy can play on protecting those that have been made to struggle the most. Whether they intended this or not, the situation in Quebec adds to a strong body of evidence that proves that food insecurity can and should be reduced through policy interventions. I also don't think we need to waste time and resources with another basic income pilot to prove this. We already know the transformative potential that something like a basic income can have on food insecurity across this country. We already have this data, in fact but our politicians never speak about it, and unfortunately, come the holiday season, neither does the mainstream media in this country. My last example on this potential for public policy to address food insecurity is centered on the experience of low-income older adults. The data on food insecurity shows us that the prevalence of food insecurity drops substantially as soon as low-income older adults reach retirement age. It's, it's a drop in food security of almost 50%. 50%, that's huge. And this happens because seniors actually have access to a form of basic income in this country by way of the old age security program, the guaranteed income supplement, and any other income from pensions that they've contributed to. The drop in rates of food security uh, is both sizable and undeniable. Unfortunately, 6.9 million Canadians forced to endure food insecurity can't wait until they're 65 to escape, for an escape from food insecurity. They need action now. Reducing household food insecurity requires the commitment of public revenue, policies, and resources to ensure that incomes are adequate, secure, and responsive to the changing costs of living. We need honest conversations about the root causes of food insecurity in this country, and we need politicians brave and ambitious enough to put food insecurity where it belongs once and for all in our country's history books. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for such a thoughtful uh, opening salvo. A couple of quick questions Please. for you before we move on to, to Inbo. Uh, very arresting, your, your line about asking policymakers to stop sorting the tins and to start sorting the policy. Um, the fact is, though, that in the month of March 2023 alone, nearly 2 million Canadians um, made use of a, of, a, of a food bank. How do you walk that back? How do you undo such a what has become a serious dependency on you, say, as you say, as a charity. It, it doesn't seem like an easy thing to do very quickly. It certainly isn't an easy thing to do. And many of us have no recollection to a time before food banks existed. The first food bank in this country opened in 1981. Before that, food banks weren't a part of people's uh, journey to access the food that they need. 
So I think we need to go back to that time. And back then, we actually looked at income-based interventions to respond to these sorts of issues, much more like Europe at the time. And instead, there was this big shift, this big shift where there was no political debate, no political discussion, no public discourse, where we've moved to food-based interventions. So I think there absolutely are policies. There are absolutely you know, things like income, things like um, a basic income are the types of policies that we could look to immediately mm -hmm. to significantly reduce uh, dependency on food banks and food insecurity overall. We see it happening already every day when it comes to seniors. Can you give us, for those of us who don't follow it every day, where the discussion is currently on basic income? in this country? Huh, that's a really good question. Uh, where the discussion is on basic income, it seems to be a discussion. Um, some people say that there's a policy window around basic income. I'm critical of the idea of policy windows. Um, I think uh, basic income is an important intervention. It is an important tool that will help us address food insecurity, but it is a go forward intervention. So when I think about, you know, further to uh, Evan's point earlier around who's at the table, who's informing these sorts of conversations or policy windows, to me it's really clear that white supremacy is having a significant impact on, on identifying something like basic income as a policy window because it does nothing to address the generations of uh, inequity, harm, violence that racialized, particularly black and indigenous communities have been forced to endure. So I think we need to have a much more nuanced conversation about basic income that includes restitution by way of things like reparations. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you a little bit later. Involved, please go ahead. Great, thank you. It's a if real you honor. Can you hear me? A real honor and pleasure to, to be here and to participate in this panel. Um, my name is Inbal Bekarechev. Um, and I have, we, I, I work a lot with satellite information. And I think some of what ties, I think, all of us in some senses in a, in a, a message around data and data that's actionable, that we can understand better where the interventions are working, how do we improve interventions. And, and I think as we've heard, um, food insecurity has, is growing significantly and, and fast. Unfortunately, we're only getting further and further away from the sustainable development goal of zero hunger. There are many causes that are complex and very much regional and, and across the world, but we do know that poverty, we do know that, that wars and armed conflicts and a changing climate with more extreme weather events are large drivers of that. And I think to address these challenges, we need to have data, and we need to have data that's transparent, that's actionable, that's timely, that's in the hands of the right people that we can understand and we can help also translate data into these kinds of information. And so at NASA Harvest, we're very much focused on the satellite part of, of that information and, and, that, uh, and technological advances within that, that can provide information that's timely, that's transparent, that's global and local, that can ultimately help to inform decisions, whether those are farmer decisions of what and when to plant, when to sell, to government policies and investments, whether those are so social safety net programs, um, to humanitarian decisions. And we often lack that data. We lack information, very basic information than one we think we have. Like where are all the global croplands of the world? Where are specific crops being grown and when? How much has been harvested? What's our production, right? There's a lot of information we have and a lot of information that's still missing. And in particular, when you start to think about smallholder systems in countries um, where we have a lot less information and, and data. And so what I would like to do is, is talk perhaps about a, an, an example of, of some of the work that, that we've been doing on, on helping to provide some more transparency. And, and one of those is around the war in Ukraine. And many of you will be aware that Ukraine is a big world uh, producer of food, very important for international global markets. Before the war, it was the fifth largest wheat exporter in the world, accounting for around 11% of the world's uh, wheat trade. It's the number one sunflower oil exporter, uh, accounting for about 50% of global sunflower exports. I think once the war occurred, many of you might have noticed the, the large jump in prices in particular of, of these commodities. And it's the third largest rapeseed exporter, what you call in Canada, uh, canola. So in other words, the food that's produced in Ukraine is critical for global trade and for feeding many people around the world, um, as well as for, of course, for its own population. But once the war broke out, 
it was much harder to collect information around what was the impact of the war, how much of Ukraine's cropland was being occupied by Russia, what was going to be the impact, how much of the wheat that is, it's a winter wheat primarily, so it was planted before the war started, how much of that would be able to be harvested? How much of the spring crops that are largely corn and, and sunflower could actually be planted? And so there were a lot of different rumors around and a lot of speculation that anywhere between 30 and 50% wouldn't be harvested, wouldn't be planted. And we were approached um, by the, the government of Ukraine, the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food, to support them using satellite data because in this case, satellite data was actually the only way to be able to rapidly assess what was happening. And in particular, in the Russian occupied territories. And so, um, what we were able to do is, first of all, right when the war started, to assess that around 22% of Ukraine's total croplands were under Russian occupation. We could look at, um, and in fact, what we found was quite surprising, while most people expected a very significant shortfall of food production out of Ukraine, we saw that production was actually um, much higher. They harvested around close to 90% of everything that had been planted. Um, the large areas that were not planted were really, or not harvested, were really around the, the front line of the war. But as we went into the occupied territories and into the Ukraine controlled territories, that was all planted. And farmers are resilient. Farmers, if they can plant, they will plant um, uh, and harvest. And, and, and that's very much what, what we saw. And so that information actually had um, a, a significant impact. For one, it helped to inform a decision on not putting an export ban. And many of you will know that when there are export bans, in particular in big production export countries, that has implications globally, and that will increase um, prices internationally. Um, and we also um, have continued to, to do this work, including this uh, current season. And one of the things that we were able to, to assess is how much of Ukraine's land has been abandoned due to the war. We're seeing a, a tremendous amount of artillery and, and craters, a lot of damage to um, some of the world's most productive agricultural land. And, and what we found was between 6.5 to 8.5 percent of Ukraine's total cropland was abandoned due to the war. And when we converted that to how much food was lost, could have been planted and harvested and wasn't, um, that accounted for, that could have fed uh, close to 25 million people. So those are not small numbers. When we look at what was produced uh, this year alone in the Russian occupied territories, I can give you the number in millions of tons that might not resonate in terms of how much food that is, but it's around 22% of Canada's wheat production for this year. Or it's around close to 60% of the imports of Egypt. Egypt is the world's largest wheat importer, right? So we're talking about tremendous amounts of food, where today there is no agency actually that's providing information on the Russian occupied territory. So if you look at the numbers of what is Ukraine producing, they're right now the government controlled territories, whether you're looking at the, the FAO on, on the UN side of things, or where you're looking at the Ukrainian government or the US Department of Agriculture. And so that is really important to have that transparency, to have that, that kind of information. And so, um, but this kind of information, I'm just trying to illustrate one example, is really important. And you can, you, uh, this kind of information can help inform farmer decisions. If you're a farmer in Saskatchewan, for example, and trying to decide when should I sell my grain? Should I store it or should I sell? What should I plant? Should it be? And, and this kind of information can become very important. It can become very important for informing decisions of governments on sustainable practices. Which ones work best where? How do we make better recommendations? Uh, where are we going to have shortfalls and how do we start to, to provide that kind of information? So these types of information, I think, ultimately, though, to be effective, and I think we've heard this theme throughout and we'll continue to hear that, they have to be user driven. They have to be co led. It can't be somebody sitting on the other side of the world saying, I know what's going to be valuable information for you. These have to be done in, in partnership. They have to be um, co-owned, co-developed, co-led, and have ways to transition these kinds of information ultimately into those end user systems such that they're sustained into the, the future. And I see I'm out of time, so I'll stop there at a few more comments. Perfect we'll timing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh I have never, I'm nowhere near a subject matter expert on this, so forgive me for these, for these questions, but how is it that that kind of data gets into the hands of a farmer in Saskatchewan? What's the access like? That's a very good question. So I think a lot of what we try to do in, in this sense is to provide information that's global and transparent, right? And so that if we have better information on markets, on what's happening in the big exporting countries or in the most vulnerable 
countries. And so on our side, we have something called the, the crop monitor, but there's a lot of systems and, and information that are going out in place. And I know that different farmers actually go and, and, and look at these kinds of information. Um, and then, of course, you try also to work with different organizations that farmers are more tied into when you're starting to think more about practices and different decisions at the field or subfield level. But there's a lot of work going on in the satellite space in terms of um, different use cases for farmers to use. And the other thing I was curious about is what did actually, ha what was the impact on the rest of the world's producers of the information that you did uncover about Ukraine and what was going on there? What did, how did it affect the farmer in Saskatchewan or in India or somewhere else? For one, understanding that there was actually a lot of production, right? So production was still reduced relative to the five-year average for Ukraine, but, but was actually pretty close to that. And so what that meant is that there wasn't an export ban. Um, and then that means that the prices didn't skyrocket. And so having that understanding of that grain will come onto the market. In that case, the, the grain corridor was still operating. We know now that that's not, and Ukraine is working very hard to get still those grain exports out. But having knowledge of what's happening in global markets does actually influence decisions of a lot of farmers around the world of what they're going to plant, what's going to be most profitable, what's needed. If you look also at sometimes farmers in the southern hemisphere when you have asynchronous seasons can be very informed around what's happening in the northern hemisphere and again be able to then influence those kinds of decisions. Great. Thank you very much, Inbo. Jennifer, if you could start by introducing yourself and start your seven minutes. Yeah, thanks, Nala. Thank um, my name is Jennifer Grenz. I'm an assistant professor and Ingla Katmuk Indigenous Scholar, uh, jointly appointed between the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Um, and my research focuses on the reclamation and revitalization of Indigenous food systems. And so when we're talking about um, solutions today is, you know, looking to our knowledges and communities, um, you know, in terms of land stewardship as well as our, our food systems to inform solutions. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, during my undergraduate degree at UBC, my husband and I lived into what was referred to then as like married student housing. Um, and it was one of the longest places that we ever lived. Um, for five years, we came and went from our tiny little apartment and we got to know no one. Uh, we could recognize the couples that lived beside us and across from us, you know, perhaps exchanging the occasional nod as we unlocked our doors a few meters apart from each other, but we never knew them. And it's not because we aren't friendly people, I think. <laughs> um, it's just that this is what our metropolitan society has become. You know, individualism, nuclear families, disconnection. And this experience came to mind as I was kind of struggling to figure out um, how to properly characterize what I see um, as the root causes of food insecurity for this panel today. My lab at UBC, the Indigenous Ecologies Lab, we work only in service to Indigenous communities on land healing initiatives where we apply a food systems lens to ecological restoration. And in all of these communities, um, as well as a number of the small and rural communities that they exist beside or within, I witness firsthand uh, the existence and power of alternative food systems. Um, and well, I thought my focus today would be on how we need to transform how we see natural lands as food and give recognition to these traditional food systems like protein sources like deer and elk and moose and fruit sources, you know, like huckleberries and salmonberries that they deserve, a, you know, they're, they're critical and often overlooked contributors to food security, not just in indigenous communities, um, but rural ones as well. And the sharing and trading that accompanies them, you know, protein sources for plant foods. Um, this is really a hidden part um, of our food system that functions outside of capitalism and outside of commodification. And really today I wanted to point squarely at capitalism as the cause of food insecurity and the sharing economies of these communities, you know, that of purposefully stewarded lands as a solution. Um, but thinking more deeply about these systems and my experiences, um, both in these communities and um, like my experience at UBC, not knowing my neighbors, I realized that capitalism um, wasn't quite the problem. And alternative food systems are only part of the solution, um, or rather, they're a symptom of a solution. Um, so this summer, as I worked battling invasive species on the shores of a northern uh, North Coast indigenous community that I work alongside, I was watching as their fishing boats were coming in at the end of the day. And I watched the fish being brought immediately to the homes of elders and families with children first. 
And on my own family's small farm in Parksville, um, I grow and I preserve fruits and vegetables every chance I get. Um, I can and dry everything. And this fall, my friends from the nation whose traditional territory that we live on brought us fish. And I packed up a huge box of all of our preserves, canned fruits, canned juices, vegetables, dried herbs, and berries. You know, and these are alternative food systems that are rooted in reciprocity, you know, with people and our lands and our waters and respect and sharing and caring for others to ensure that all are fed. And none of it can exist without those strongly knit communities. And I realized, thinking back to our apartment at UBC, that the answer, you know, isn't entirely in government policies and solutions. Um, in fact, it might be foolish for us to be relying on the hope of systemic change. I hate saying that, but people are suffering right now with food insecurity. And really, we are the answer. Um, we have to take responsibility for creating these communities where they don't exist. Um, community in the truest sense, like I get to witness in the indigenous communities that I work with and the rural communities surrounding them as well. Most of us live in this metropolis and many of us, while living among so many people, find ourselves living entirely alone, trying to do it all, take care of ourselves. And to me, we have to find a way to create community that ensures no one's left behind. That it's not solely about existing within an alternative food system, as great as that can be, it's about existing in a system of community care. And that then perhaps frees up resources for things like food, you know, realizing that not all of our food can come from our lands and waters. You know, care for children as an offset, you know, as an example. Sharing economies, like reciprocity that supports whole lives and setting the bar higher than coexistence. I was recently at a gathering on Haida Gwaii for Indigenous food champions, and it was a gathering of mostly Indigenous people from several different nations working on indigenous food systems reclamation and revitalization. And it was to be a creation of a new community to support those of us doing this kind of work. And as part of that, we were asked to each bring something to share with the whole group. And on the final day, we would have this sharing table and you would get to choose, you know, what, what you were, um, you know, something that you would like to take home. And if there's anything that I've learned about indigenous communities is that we take gifting very seriously. We will not be outgifted. Um, a Haida <laughs> friend of mine was like, you'll never outgift a Haida. And I was like, you want to bet, <laughs> right? Um, and I left that event with my suitcase like way overweight and like, God bless the Air Canada lady who kind of just pretended she didn't see <laughs> and took my suitcase. But I left with this abundance of jam and honey and seeds and tubers. I got Haida potatoes and Shimshan potatoes and dried plants for making medicines and art and books. And I was just overwhelmed by the abundance that comes from the creation of community. You know, so there's no one way we can fix food insecurity, you know, and as we recognize that, um, I think it's time for us to think about these social innovations, you know, in, in understanding what communities need and working by their values in recognizing that there's opportunity for innovation at the local community level um, and where we can focus on collective well-being and, and build community level resilience. So, thank, you thank you very much, Jennifer. such intuitive and compelling ideas um, and you've spoken previously about kind of this slow and reluctant um, inclusion of indigenous ways of thinking not just about reciprocity but about you know restoration and, and these kinds of things what's what's in the way of that is it a lack of is it persuasion or the unwillingness to be persuaded why are these those ideas not being you know, taken up by everyone. Well, I, I think that they, they are starting to. You know, I think there's just such a misunderstanding of who our communities are and that we're still here. And that, you know, if you want adaptation experts, you really should come to us for the answers, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I feel a lot of hope now. You know, there's more and more interest in our knowledges to... 
and, and our worldviews to inform or provide a grander picture, you know, because we should be further ahead than we are. And maybe it's just having more uh, contributions by different worldviews and perspectives that are going to help complete the picture. So I think we're, we're almost there. <laughs> is there an example that you can provide it where food security is concerned? In terms where, of... Where it's, it is actually being taken up by people outside, you know, of the Indigenous circles. Yeah, I mean, even just within, when we think about climate event recovery, you know, um, wildfire recovery is something that I am actively working on um, in the neighboring territory to my own, where my cousins are in Shatliam territory. Um, you know, there's all these things, that you, there's a big scar on the landscape, like the fires are so severe, they look like moonscape. So no one really knows what to do. And um, you know, so everyone's like, well, we need to kind of put things back the way they are. And the indigenous communities are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is food systems collapse, not just traditional food systems, but agrarian food systems as well. This is a ranching area. So we need to apply a food systems lens to the whole recovery effort. Whereas before it was about, well, we got to put these trees back and dump this seed and all that, but it wasn't this food systems lens. And when I started to talk about that, you know, in our multi-stakeholder gatherings, there's like, holy smokes, you're right, this is the collapse of food systems. And if we think about it that way, we're gonna make sure everybody is tended to. Like, what about the food systems for the bears? What about the food systems for the, for the deer? You know, and then ourselves, both traditionally as well as within the agrarian setting. And that really is bringing everyone much more together and giving this cohesion going forward that we're all in pursuit of the same goal. It just looks a little bit different depending on what part of the food system and cycle you're on. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Patrick, last but not least, oh, sorry, <laughs> last but not least, seven minutes, please. Thank you. And again, great pleasure uh, to be here with you. Um, Patrick Webb, um, I'm a professor, a geographer, like you, Evan, uh, but a professor in the nutrition school at uh, Tufts University in Boston. Um, it's been great to hear this progression of, of discussion, food, food insecurity. For, I am going to talk about food. I'm actually going to talk about diets in particular as the core uh, when we talk about food. But I, in all my years of working on, on food insecurity with indigenous or, or peoples around the world, the things that I come away with are uncertainty, pain, shame, fear. Uh, it's not just the hunger dimension, it's the, the things that wrap around hunger that make the experience of food insecurity so damaging at the individual, the household, community level. And we don't hear nearly enough outrage uh, of, of that dimension of food insecurity. The fact that people feel shame that they can't put food for their babies or they feel fear literal fear that they won't be able to, to put ta food on the table next week. There's, there's, a, there's a serious problem here, structural problem. You use the word food systems uh, collapse. And that's what it comes down to. So my, what I'm putting on the table is that food insecurity is all the things that have been said so far, but I, I put it in this bigger picture of food systems collapse, or put it on a positive sense, food systems transformation. Why is that? Well, we, you know, where we are relying, the, the systems we rely on today were essentially designed in the 1940s to generate cheap calories for as many people, mainly urban consumers, as possible uh, through maximizing, not optimizing, maximizing yields and productivity, uh, maximizing use of inputs. We, we all know the positives that have ar arisen from that. We all, most of us know some of the negatives that have arisen from that. But at the point today where we're relying on food banks, where we're, our bre bread baskets are collapsing or at threat of collapse, and where indigenous peoples see food systems uh, collapse, we have a problem. The system that was set up backwards 60, 70 years ago is not the system that we need going forward 70 years from now. We need to be thinking, we policymakers and everyone that leads to policy, need to be thinking about, well, what is it we want our food system to look like in 2060, 70, 80, and then work backwards to figure out what on earth is it going to need to get us there? Because 
If we don't, there's so much that's going wrong. And I'm not, I don't want to focus on the negatives, but it is important that food, diets, are at the core of so many of humanity's current existential challenges, right? Diets are at the core of 800 million people going hungry every day. They're at the core of 3.2 billion people unable to afford a healthy diet every day. Diets are the outcome of the food systems that generate one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not just from agriculture, by the way, Evan. It's the whole food system. It's the transportation, the refrigeration, the, everything else that goes along the food system as a whole. So climate change, so climate health, human health, 20% of all preventable disease relates to dietary, suboptimal diets. One in five people are dying through suboptimal diets. Now, you, you, so a lot of the um, child uh, labor uh, problems I around the world in terms of exploitation of child labor happens in agriculture and food value chains subsequently. So there's lots of things wrong with the many systems that generate the food on which we rely. And so we have to, we have to, this isn't a luxury, we have to change those systems. We have to go for transformation. And a year ago, uh, the Prime Minister of Nepal um, was quoted as saying, uh, and I quote, transforming our food systems is akin to building a new fortress against hunger and food insecurity, end quote. Right? Clearly stating we've got to do something big and this is the way we will protect the future against hunger and food insecurity. Now, there's going to be lots of actions required across lots of sectors, and there are, in fact, examples where countries, governments, we can talk about those, are beginning to take this more seriously than they ever have in the past. But we have to do this. What we do know is the system isn't working. My, my brief uh, personal note is a few years ago, my wife and family and I trekked up to Everest Base Camp, uh, not to the summit, just up to the base camp. That, that was hard <laughs> enough. Jeez, that was hard enough. Uh, as you get higher and higher above the tree line, up above 17,000, 18,000 feet, um, the number of little tea rooms where you sleep at night, if freezing to death, this was in December, not a good idea. Uh, they thin out because there's, there's fewer and far between. But what you notice is that there are no roads, there are no vehicles up that high. Everything has to be carried in on the back of a Sherpa. Every single thing. Toilet paper, pens, and food, right? And what we could see, every village we would walk through, you'd have the, the lovely gaggle of children coming out, beautiful children rushing out, and every single one of them had either a bag of chips or a bag of cookies, salted cookies, or a, f a beverage. It doesn't matter which sugar-sweetened beverage it is. Every single one of them, that's what they were carrying. Now, I'm not bemoaning ultra-processed foods. I'm not going to go into that. But the point is, the system allows those products to reach the most remote parts of the world you can imagine. That's, by, that's vertically. It's the same horizontally. But, as Evan said, there are not enough fruits and veg produced glo globally to even meet minimum uh, food-based dietary guidelines. So the system isn't fit for purpose. It has to change. We have to think about what comes next. Where do we go in the future? And there are many ways to be positive about that future. Thank you very much, Patrick. What, what your... What you're describing, reinventing a global food system, as you say, building a fortress, is, is, is another um, process that is, is long-term thinking, what's required here. And as you know, as we discussed earlier, most governments are not naturals at doing this. Yeah. How do you go about building that kind of interest in that long-term process uh, in governments that are so transient? Great question. And Obviously, this is a, an issue of political economy. Uh, my answer would be we found that 
you know, it used to be when I first started, I, I worked for the CGIR, and if really the first place you'd go would be a prime minister or a president's office, or, you know, you, you'd treat that as the policy maker at the highest level. You learn very, very quickly that, yes, things get written, get signed at that level, but the work gets done many lowers below, layers below that. And actually cultivating long-term engagement with uh, bureaucrats, right? The, the civil servants who are typically in place for much longer than politicians um, can serve well. And so it's, it's bureau bureaucrats, it's think tanks who advise multiple governments uh, year <laughs> after year, um, and it's uh, sub-national governance as well, which is often less, rotates perhaps less often than the national uh, politics do. So sure. thinking who, who will be there in the long run, who will benefit from a long perspective mm -hmm. and, and going after them. You mentioned in, in your comments that there are countries that are actually excelling at this. Can you, can you provide an example? Sure. Um, well, excelling in the commitment to do something different right. would be if there are countries like Rwanda, Nepal, Ethiopia, I think in particular, which is a big country, has made quite strong commitments at all levels to for more integrated policy. That's the word they're saying, less silo, siloed, working across ministries, establishing or networks above ministries to try and allow for systemic change to happen, but then linking that down to new ways of working with the private sector and then down to the bottom, things like um, multi-purpose cooperative institutions, which have been established, not like old co-ops, essentially just to aggregate and sell their food, but actually as this, the on the ground face of change, right? So that can fulfill many functions, receive many different types of resource and advice and, and work creatively. Yeah. Great. Well, of course, we don't have enough time to get into every single one of your statements, but I'd like to try at least for 15 minutes before we go to audience questions. And I think stating the obvious, we have to acknowledge that the answer to the problem of food security lies at the intersection of these and many other ideas out there. So that's the starting point. And with that in mind, I wondered if I could go to each of you again, just with a, sh a short question. If you could pick one of the other panelists' proposals, <laughs> Uh, as a starting point, and this isn't really a debate, it's a conversation. Where would you begin, Paul? Where, where would you start? Good question. Hmm. I guess I'm, I'm a little bit less willing to let uh, capitalism and commodification off the hook. You know, I think in this country, um, uh, we have been given this thing called a right to food, introduced in 1966, ratified 10 years later in 1976. It means that the government has a responsibility in this country to ensure that we all have access to the food that we need. So I, I think there's something there. I think num a number of people have tried to uh, you know, leverage the right to food or the commitments under the, the right to food to push for, you know, the kinds of interventions and the kinds of policies that we know will lead to people having access to the food that they need. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that's one that certainly um, I think is really important. Sure. Jennifer, you had said that the answer lies with us. It's not with government. Is there a, I mean, I'm sure that's not a black and white statement, but. N no. And, and, and I, I, what I meant by that is that it's not, we can't leave it entirely with the government um, because the speed with which it works is in many cases too slow. Yeah. And so in, in the meantime, um, you know, I would hope that we could action ourselves like, oh, recognizing even in our own way of life and behaviors every day that we could be working harder at building community and getting to know people enough that we know when they might need some support that we may be able to offer them. Sure. So maybe just staying with you, where would you go, having heard the proposals that your, your colleagues have made, where would you go kind of as a starting point? Well, I think data is incredibly important and something I talk a lot about in my research is that we need to bring the tools of the new and old ancestors together for the benefit of all. And, you know, there's so much power in the specificity of the data that we can get now where these sort of cookie cutter blanket approaches over landscapes, they don't work. 
but if we can get to know a greater level of specificity within communities, we can get those localized results that we're looking for and empower people, you know, in that, so, yeah. In both, so one of the concerns that comes up always with data are privacy concerns and, and you know, how much data, how much do we know about everybody's actions? How do you, how do you deal with those questions? Those are questions that come up all the time. I think one thing um, that I didn't say about satellite data in particular, we have lots and lots of free and open satellite data. And a lot of these satellites that are being put up to space, whether it's from the Canadian Space Agency, the, the European NASA, are all free and open. And I think um, for the purpose of, of aiding and, and providing more transparency, of course, then there are the questions about, well, you know, how much information do you have about my specific farm? And I think th those are really important dialogues about how do we use these data. And not only, I think we're seeing more and more increase in a lot of technology and tools, whether it's AI and, and cloud computing and, and, and the, the convergence of all these information. And I think it's, it's not only data, but it's being honest about what the data is and giving the uncertainties around what, you know, you run a model and you get a, a result, but making sure that we're really transparent and honest about what that data is actually saying, how it was produced, how it was validated are really important um, questions on, on that as well. I'll be back to you. Go I ahead, think that's yeah. so, Actually, I think that's so important for a number of reasons. I want to pick up on a couple of pieces. The first was around government slowness. I think we all need to reject this. I think we, you know, we just need to go back a little while to the CERB. The CERB came out very, very quickly. When government prioritizes something and sees it as an, ur as an urgent, something urgent, they will move quickly. You mean the payments that were given out during COVID? Exactly. So I, I think governments convince us that they, they, can, they can be slow, but again, they prioritize things when they need to. I think the question of data is really important and what data we look at. Because in this country, for example, when we look at the data around poverty, it tells uh, a wonderful story. And we have, you know, uh, members of parliament, go uh, government officials of every ilk, um, speaking about um, the, the, what, the incredible impacts that we're having around reducing poverty. Poverty. But actually, poverty is some arbitrary, that, that the line, that the measure is quite arbitrary. I think the thing that's really important about food insecurity data is it speaks to people's lived experience, and that is going a very different direction than the data around poverty. So, yes, data is super key and make being critical and interrogating it and understanding where that data is coming from and who's asking the questions and for what purpose, I think, is, is critical. Nala, can I? Just push back just a little bit. Absolutely. <laughs> and please don't wait for me. Jump in. <laughs> uh, any of you, please. I, Go ahead. You know, it's not about letting government off the hook when we talk, characterize it as slow. But our communities have suffered for many, many years waiting for the government to do something. And so I think it's about empowering ourselves to do something in the meantime. And like, yes, when government's motivated, they can ask quick, answer quickly. But then we're relying on them to prioritize what's affecting us in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. And so I think it's like, you know, there's not one silver bullet here, yeah. but it's like, what are we doing while we're waiting for them? And ever, like, I sit with elders all the time. They're like, they're done waiting. Right. They're like, you just got to go. You just got to do this. Yeah. yeah. Patrick, just your thoughts. Uh, we'll go back to the round of questions, but your thoughts on, as you're listening to this conversation about government, because you must see examples of this around the world. Uh, absolutely. But I, let me respond again on data. <laughs> I think data, sure. absolutely data uh, are essential. But increasingly, I find that we need, we need the appropriate data that supports a clear narrative, mm -hmm. right? Not just points of you know, statistics, uh, which speaks to your, you know, the difference between poverty and, and food insecurity. Uh, they're very different measures. They overlap, but they're very different. Um, as we move towards a food systems transformation, hopefully, then it's, it's not that we need more data, new data, but what we do need is information that helps tell the story, that things are moving in the right direction, that things are being done. And some of those may relate to governance, for example, uh, and governance, governments, what our governments do or not, mm -hmm. what are they doing or not, um, in, in terms of putting in pr legislation into practice or um, enabling certain uh, policies to be seen on the ground at a certain time, right? That's very different from how many documents have you signed uh, at top. And the other end is different numbers about not just you know, the, the, metric, the cost per metric ton of, of corn, but the, the cost per 100 calories of yeah. different kinds of foods that are produced that can help us better understand what is affordable or not 
to different people, right? The, still statistics, but a very different narrative it's associated. Yeah. Did you want to also make a comment when you recall what we've talked about so far about where to begin? If Let's imagine, even though government is maybe our, our first priority, that we're writing a white paper for, for a government. Wh where would you begin in, in radically changing the picture of food security? At, at this point, I put most of my efforts in trying to connect connect dots. Yeah. So given that climate change is, is so directly linked to food systems, ensure, ensuring better integration of, clim, of diets and food systems into co the COP process and, and the climate change agenda. But the same applies to the human justice agenda, which doesn't always think about food systems as a, as a priority entry point. Same thing, the human health, the public health Practitioners don't always think about food. In fact, they rarely think about nutrition. Uh, but given that the, it, you know, poor diets are <laughs> such a major underpinning of poor human health, yeah. which is crippling health budgets in many countries around the world, there are linkages there. So in a sense, trying to use food, food insecurity, dietary patterns, as the linchpin that enables us to tell this narrative and show how these things are all connect. And it is the one, one of the few common things we all eat. Yeah. At least, well, five times a day, Evan, maybe. But, <laughs> yeah. so, some not even once a day, but we all have to eat. And bringing okay. that to the core of the discussion humanizes it, but also makes it possible to link to these other systems thinking that need to be done. And Bill, what would be your answer to that, having heard what your colleagues said? And I think it's around, well, I, I agree with, with what's been said. I think it's around asking the right questions, making sure that when you're developing the data, collecting the data, it is with that purpose and, and in an honest way and, and converting that data into information. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges are is we have loads of data, but how do you actually transfer that into information into the hands of those that need that in order to make um, decisions? And, and I think that's really critical for, for everything that, that we're saying. Were you going to add something? Yeah, I just, yeah. Uh, you know, as we're talking about data, mm -hmm. I have to come back to, I want to uh, introduce another point, you know, sure. I'm, uh, so I'm in this space uh, with all of you that, uh, let's be frank, is predominantly white. Um, it's diverse, but predominantly white. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we have to challenge, uh, you know, in solution finding spaces and how we take the data. You know, I was a part of this project with Proof that, um, Proof out of the University of Toronto, that looked at data that has existed for a long time, but actually disaggregated race-based data and found, you know, very, very different experiences uh, for black Canadian households versus, you know, the kind of aggregate data that is routinely reported out on and commented on. You know, black households are three and a half times more likely to experience food insecurity. Yeah. We, we know that, you know, that the kind of narrative around food insecurity in this country that is based on aggregate data suggests that if someone lives in a single parent household, they're less likely to experience, they're more likely to experience food insecurity. Well, of course, but actually not of course, because for black Canadians, the risk and prevalence for food insecurity remains high, regardless of how many parents are in the household. The protection that I talked about for seniors doesn't exist for black Canadians. So I think there's a really important um, need for disaggregated race-based data and to also prioritize those who have been, um, have had to bear the brunt of the inequities associated with food insecurity to not only lead, but to be resourced to lead uh, in the solution finding spaces. I wanna make sure we leave time for audience questions, but I do wanna ask you this. As people who are working in different areas, but all on a topic that affects so many of us, how do you ensure, how do you begin to make sure that the message is coherent, that these different parts of thinking about food security are actually working hand in glove. Is there a form for that? Patrick, could you speak to that? Is there anything resembling that, aside from this conversation here today? I, you know, we, we've never met. We come from very different backgrounds, but I think we share, we may not have exactly the same idea, but I think we share a pretty good core mm -hmm. of that's probably my phone going off, but typical. Um, so I don't think there needs to be necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a forum that right. dictates, because I think we all need to speak to our own audiences 
with a similar message strongly um, that isn't at, at purposes, and I don't think they are at purposes, uh, uh, essentially. The ideas of, of uh, food insecurity are constantly evolving, and, and the, the high-level panel of experts that Evan has just been um, uh, just joining in, in Rome has just recently expanded the, the definition of food insecurity to include not just availability and affordability, but agency and sustainability. And I think a lot of other people were already using those terms before it got codified, if you like, at a UN level. So it, it's not that there needs to be one place where everything is agreed. I think we're, we're doing, doing well. I think we just need to build on our collective enthusiasm, outrage, and energy uh, to reach diverse audiences. That's my view. I know we, we want to talk about solutions, but I do want to have a very quick answer from each of you of, of and Paul, back to you, of, of what, what's the cost of not acting urgently on the question of food insecurity? It'll continue to increase. Uh, we will continue to have families across this country and parents across this country looking in their kids' eyes and not knowing whether or not they can feed them. Uh, and that, to me, is horrific. Yeah. I, we're here in Toronto, the, you know, in one of the richest countries in the world, richest province, richest city. Certainly, we should be leading with demonstrating what it means to care for one another and ensure that the youngest among us have access to food, that all of us have access to food. And Paul? I think we can't afford not to. I think we are in unparalleled territory in terms of food insecurity, locally to globally. And, and I think we recognize that and, and we have to move and we have to move quickly. It's urgent. Jen? Well, I think it's just not being treated like the emergency that it is. And I think that those of us that belong to groups who have been disproportionately affected by it, you know, it's very frustrating that it's taking this long for the rest of the world to wake up to it. And so I think, you know, we need to see more of us in these interdisciplinary storytelling roles leading that discussion to make sure the right questions get asked and the right interpretation of the data, you know, happens. Yeah. And Patrick. The estimated costs of putting food systems transformation into place are, you know, anyone's guess, but let's say 300 billion a year, billion a year. A lot of money, but hey, not all that much compared to the whole uh, world economy. The cost of no doing nothing and being forced to act 30 years from now when our world planet is burning and everything that we see today, you can ramp up 20-fold, is going to be trillions. Yeah. And yeah, there doesn't seem to be the urgency. Yeah. To, to take this on yet. So we, ha so we have to be making this clear to more people. On that very sobering note, thank you to all of you. Uh, and opening up to questions to any of you. I think there's a microphone, someone with a microphone. Oh, this person right here with a, phone, with a microphone. Just put your hand up and she'll come to you if you have a question for any of the panelists. I see a question back at the right there. Yeah, thank you. Hi, th Whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> thank you very much. That was an excellent um, way to kick off the day. Um, I wanted to build on this last question about the true cost of not acting. And Patrick, to your point, I think the estimate is 12 trillion is the current cost of, um, of our food system in terms of health outcomes, climate outcomes, loss of livelihood along the food value chain. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization just brought out a report, The State of Food and Agriculture, I believe it was last week, and it is on this question of the true cost. Um, I'm wondering, with increasing information and data on the true cost, how, how do we get that into the hands of the policymakers, and how do we use that information to drive change? Is that to Patrick or to any anyone who wants? Patrick, we'll start with you. Thanks for that. Very, very important but very challenging question. It's simpler 
in a way, it seems simpler than it is. Um, so th there, are, there are still many ways of measuring, let's say, let's say, the true cost of food, where it's not just the price you pay in the supermarket, but the, the externalities, the costs involved uh, in uh, carbon emissions in terms of heat loss, in terms of refrigeration use and, and so on, right? And all the way back through to labor ex exploitation. You know, if you factor all, everything that went in to producing an apple, the cost of that apple, that, let's say at 50 cents, would probably be in fact three three dollars, right? Instead of 50 cents. The challenge is who bears those costs? Right now they're largely invisible. The consumer pays a chunk of it the producer gets a very little of it, but the, the, the costs are borne along a very long value chain, and it, that still needs to be unpackaged. We need, and, but it's not just unpackaging, it's, and we haven't really talked much about the private sector here. A lot of what goes on between farm and fork is private sector mm -hmm. business, and enhancing the efficiency of what they do and getting them on board to produce the healthiest of products, not just the most profitable of products, is a perennial challenge, right? So I'm, I, I won't go on, keep going in that space. We need to better understand the costs of doing everything. Food is one of those. Um, but then ascribing responsibility for bearing that cost is going to be one of our biggest challenges going in the next, next decade. Do you want to tackle yeah. that, Paul? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come at this a little bit differently, sure. um, but maybe not so differently. Um, I think, so driving change, uh, the questions around driving change as governments come and go, this sort of thing. Well, I think about solidarity, and I think about how so much has changed in the last 40, 50 years. We used to care about each other. Uh, and, you know, I hate to be so crass, but I, I don't think we do in the same way. We used to actually sit over the fence and talk to our neighbor. Now we race from our vehicle, we race into our units, and we don't want to talk to anybody. You ever hear that button at the elevator? If you live in a condo, like, closed door, closed door. That's the reality of where we're at. So I think before, you know, in order to advance the kind of change that we need, we've got to also be building solidarity, and we've got to be thinking about how do we um, move away from these transactional types of interactions that have become so commonplace to more relational type uh, um, organizing, uh, building relationships, because I think then we can start to care about and advocate for those that are being left behind and actually uh, put some skin in the game in terms of ensuring that folks are no longer left behind. And I also think, you know, one of the things that gets in the way of our ability to do that is we are so busy. We are trying to stay alive. We're trying to find childcare. We're trying to find housing. We're trying to find affordable medicine. So I think, again, in one of the richest countries in the world, if we could commit to a framework that advances a decent quality of life, that includes things perhaps like a basic income, perhaps you know, affordable childcare, building the affordable housing that we need, pharma care, these are the sorts of things that I think will give us the kind of time to maybe not be pushing that elevator button and wanting to engage with our neighbor and wanting to advance the kind of change to ensure that no one's left behind. Okay, thank you. Is there another question in the audience? There are two back there, I think. Yeah. Maybe we'll try, we only have about seven more minutes. We'll try to get through as many as possible. So with that in mind, please go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you all of you and thank you to the Errol uh, Food Institute for this, uh, this conference. My name is Jeff Nykabel. I'm the CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, which is a national public institution with a mandate to promote understanding and awareness and engagement between Canada and Asia. And in February, uh, we'll be convening a major Canada-Asia agri-food conference in Singapore. Happy, and my colleague uh, Jordan Dupuy is here also. We're happy to talk to folks about it. My question is about, is about the role of international exchanges in all of this. And I say exchanges, it's a broad term. You know, trade, international trade is, is you know, essential in the global food system. And uh, Canadians derive a portion of their prosperity from our country's participation in international trade, not only in commodities, but also in, in knowledge, in innovation, in, in tech, technological uh, service offerings and so on. And it would be interesting to hear from the panelists about the role that international networks 
play also at the NGO level. I think a very fundamental point that came out is governments come and go, but it's these large grassroots movements, and we see them in places okay. in Asia, like in, in Bangladesh, for example, that have a huge role to play. So what about the role of international networks and exchanges Great. in the work that you're doing here? Thank you. Okay. Is there someone who wants to tackle that? Involved. I can have our, sure. our perspective. I would say that we as an organization wouldn't exist without having this international network. And I think the way we grew out is recognizing that the needs that, in, in our case, it was the US government looking at how do you better utilize this kind of information? How do you improve the, the ministry's information was looking at what were other people around the world doing. And so we, we started as a community, as a grassroots in a way, like looking at many different countries that evolved into a G20. Um, initiative called GeoGlam, and that was the basis actually for also starting NASA Harvest, which is NASA's global food security and agriculture program. Um, and I would say we learn a lot from each other, and I can give a, a, an example from Canada. And so Canada is the first country that um, replaced one of its cr critical agricultural surveys, the system survey, with satellite data. Um, and, and that removes a burden from farmers. That has actually also increased the accuracy. And that's been a, a model for other countries to look at and to emulate and to understand how did one country do it? How do we do this in another? Uh, so I think those are absolutely critical for many reasons. Uh, our food system is interconnected. It is global. We're all changing similar challenges in some cases, others in, in not. But having that international forum to, to come together is, is absolutely key. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep going unless anyone's burning to add more. Okay. Where are we right now? Please go ahead. Thank you. And uh, I think that what we've heard from every single panel member uh, tells us about the need to work together. There isn't one single solution to everything. But, but what came to mind as I was listening and learning is the importance of knowledge dissemination. And that includes knowledge that references disaggregated data and the impact, the varying impacts on populations and how that should influence policy making. I also thought about food security and national security and whether we need to define national security um, more broadly. I, I think, for example, the mention of health uh, and, and when, when you mentioned diet, Patrick, I thought, oh, geez, no, he's going to tell me to eat less. But I also have experienced what you talked about in terms of access to bad food, sugar-loaded diets, okay? And I think about the impact of, of that, uh, uh, poverty and, 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 and low-quality food on health like diabetes, in, in indigenous communities and poorer communities where access to healthy food is just out of reach. And I think that when we are challenged, we think and act differently. And the comment, uh, the reference to COVID times, essential workers, weren't they always essential? How did they suddenly become essential? Mm -hmm. And as soon as the COVID stats seem to have been tempered, they weren't essential anymore. They weren't being paid as if they mattered as much. So, you know, the University of Guelph, and I thank the, the work of the Health Food uh, Institute, uh, and, and I say the importance of knowledge dissemination, because policymaking and politics comes out of what policymakers and politicians understand to be the public priorities. Yeah. And therefore, the responsibility that an educational institution like the University of Guelph has to disseminate knowledge that helps to influence public awareness and public behavior cannot be underestimated. So this is as much an observation as a question okay. uh, as to how we can, you know, individually go away and think about the different roles that we each can play in that regard. So you're putting that to the panel? I'm putting that to actually to everyone, everyone. To everyone. It's a, it's a wonderful way, actually, to wrap up this conversation. 
Um, it is an ongoing conversation. Of course, you'll be having it throughout the day, but I will throw it out to any of you who wants to make a final comment, given what was just said. Jennifer? Well, I think when we come at this issue with really big numbers, we have a huge problem. <laughs> Because they're not tangible, yes. like trillions of dollars. What does that even mean? Yeah. Um, so I think it's about a balance of storytelling, you know, a different sort of data, honoring all these different data sets, which include capturing the stories of people in specific communities, in specific situations. And I, I think that then we're going to get the attention that we, we need on this. Paul, last word. Yeah, a couple of things. One, yeah. um, you know, we like to hold up our healthcare system in this country, our healthcare system that ends at our neck, but it's in actuality, it's a sick care system. You know, a healthcare system wouldn't be divorced from ensuring that we all have access to the food that we need. I think that's a critical point. I think the knowledge dissemination piece is really important, particularly when we have other actors trying to convince us of other things. You know, as food costs are going up, we have the, the government hauling out these grocery store CEOs about the cost of food, and I think this is performative and distracting. If we're going to haul out the CEO of Loblaws, which is the largest uh, private employer in this country, we should be talking about wages, um, not about some of the other stuff that is what they're bound to do anyway. Yeah. To be continued. To be continued. Paul, Inbal, Jennifer, and Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Not long enough. <laughs>